Okay, so the first thing you need to do is you need to choose a camera. And they range from something that fits in your pocket like this, right up to something huge like this. And the middle ground is now being filled by what's generically known as mirrorless cameras. I don't have a mirrorless camera here. This is my old 18 year old digital camera, which incidentally shoots uh, selfies. Um, but mirrorless cameras are roughly this size and they have interchangeable lenses, which vary in size. And we've also got entry level DSLRs, which are somewhere between the mirrorless and the full fat professional DSLRs. Now if you're the sort of person who bought the electric guitar and you were going to be the next Jimi Hendrix, you played it for a couple of weeks and it's been gathering dust ever since, I suspect that the same is going to be true if you buy a DSLR. If you don't have the patience to really learn how to use it, it's going to end up on a shelf gathering dust. Now I don't want to put you off buying a DSLR. Um, for those of you who will read the manual, will watch videos like this and will persevere, they are a great tool for creating fantastic pictures. But if you're the sort of person who has the kung fu outfit in the loft gathering dust next to the unicycle and the guitar, um, you probably ought to consider something that's going to fit into a small pocket just like your cell phone does because there's a much greater chance that you're actually going to get some use out of it. And some of these compact cameras, they will take pretty nice photos. Um, some of them are not cheap. Um, this uh, Sony RX100, I paid over £500 for it a couple of years ago. But it will take some very nice photos. Um, Okay, we'll do it with the cat. So size is an important consideration because if you buy a great big camera, you find it's too bulky to lug about. You don't properly learn how to use it. You'd be better off just getting a decent quality compact camera like this. Whereas other people who are going to use a camera in all weathers, who need something more robust, something more ergonomic, a DSLR may well be the right choice. So size is important because in practical terms, if the camera's too big, you're not going to use it potentially, and so it's a waste of money. The second most important thing, which is something that you won't see advertised on the spec list often, is the size of the sensor. Camera manufacturers like to sell cameras based on the number of megapixels, and megapixels are really not that important. A camera with a high number of megapixels, but a small sensor is a bit like a small house with a large number of rooms. It's pointless having a 10 bedroom house if each of those bedrooms is the size of a wardrobe and you can't even fit a bed into it. So it's about getting a balance between the size of the sensor and the number of megapixels. So the sensor in this Sony RX100 is a, a relatively large sensor, it it's measures an, an inch or thereabouts, whereas a typical compact camera like this has a, a tiny little sensor. 
So this one does actually punch above its weight. The entry level DSLRs, as you can see the mirror in there, that gives you an idea of the sensor size. And that's very roughly three times the size of the sensor in this camera. And then the full frame, as they're called, professional DSLRs have a sensor that's about two and a half times bigger than the entry level DSLRs as represented by this mirror here. So why is sensor size important? Well, the larger the surface area of the sensor, the more light it can capture. And the more light the camera can capture, the easier your job's going to be. And the better the quality your images are going to be once light levels start to fall. So indoors, after dark, even just on a cloudy day, image quali quality can start to suffer if the sensor is small. So those are the two main differentiating factors with the actual bodies of the cameras. The external size of the camera and the size of the sensor. Beyond camera bodies, the next most important thing is the quality of the lens. Now if you buy an entry level camera like this, it's going to come with a cheap nasty lens like this. Um, and a poor quality lens creates a bottleneck. This five year old camera has a sensor that can capture 18 megapixels, but if I stick a cheap lens like this on it, it's only capturing somewhere between five and eight megapixels worth of detail because the lens just isn't delivering the goods to the sensor. Now, what you don't want to do is blow your entire budget on your camera body. Um, there's a general rule in photography that you should budget the same amount for your lens as you do for your camera body. Um, now, I'll talk more about lenses in a later video, but you do certainly need to leave something in your budget for one or more reasonable lenses. The other advantage of a larger sensor is a larger sensor gives you more scope for creativity in your shots. You might have noticed that um, some professional photos, particularly portrait shots, the person will be in sharp focus but the background will be very blurred. Now to achieve that sort of look we need a combination of a particular type of lens that's capable of letting in a lot of light and we need to couple that with a decent sized sensor. So with a camera like this if I want a nice blurred background I'm going to struggle because even though the lens is an appropriate lens for nice blurry backgrounds when that's coupled with a relatively small sensor, I don't have the ability to blur the background in my shots, except for very limited situations where the thing I'm shooting is very close to the camera. And as we move up through the sensor sizes, we get more and more light capturing ability, and that gives us more and more scope for nice blurry backgrounds if that's a look that we want to achieve. So just to summarise, <clears throat> the smaller the camera, the more convenient. Um, when I go travelling, often this is the only piece of camera kit that I'll take with me. Um, however, in general terms, the bigger the camera gets, the bigger the sensor, and the bigger the sensor, the easier 
a job you're going to have when light levels are low. The higher the image quality you're going to get and the more scope you've got for creativity in terms of nice blurry backgrounds if that's something that you're looking to achieve. That's just to give you a rough idea of the different camera sizes. We've got the, the fully compact, fits into a small pocket, point and shoot as they're often called, but it is possible to get a nice quality point and shoot if you're prepared to spend the money. The mirrorless cameras as represented by this, that's about the sort of size. They do come with smaller lenses than this. Whilst uh, mirrorless cameras are growing in popularity um, and they are improving a lot in image quality, um, it's not uncommon to find mirrorless cameras with sensors the same size as the one in this entry level DSLR. Um, to my mind, they're neither one thing nor another. Um, you've still got quite a bit of bulk, you can't fit them in a small pocket. If you're travelling to places that you wouldn't want to have your camera on display, you can't fit them in a small pocket, so they're going to be hanging around your neck, they're going to be visible. Um, so they don't have the true compactness of a camera like this, but they also don't match the image quality of a full frame DSLR. So that's the reason that there's a gap in this lineup. I don't actually have a mirrorless camera at present. I've looked at them numerous times, but decided against. So larger sensors, better image quality, but heavier, more expensive, bulkier. Um, and what you need to decide is, is this a hobby that you're going to fully embrace or would you be better continuing to shoot with your cell phone or your point and shoot and maybe just go for a better quality point and shoot camera. But the one thing that you are going to need to do is just get out and practice shooting because the one thing you'll often hear said is that it's not about the kit, it's about your abilities. And a, and a good professional will take way better images with a camera like this than somebody who doesn't know what they're doing could achieve using high-end kit. So that's a quick introduction to the different types of camera that you might choose to go out and buy. Um, it doesn't matter whether you buy Canon, Nikon, Sony, Olympus, whatever. Um, they all make great cameras nowadays. Um, for me, the entry-level DSLR was the right way to go. A lot of the lenses that fit entry-level DSLRs can be transferred over to the full-frame professional DSLRs, so upgrading is, is relatively easy. And lenses, if you look after them, they can really hold their, their value very well. Um, unlike camera bodies, which are a bit like computers, they become obsolete very quickly, they depreciate very heavily. Lenses don't really change very much. I bought a lens a couple of years ago and it was exactly the same lens as I would have got if I bought that lens 20 years ago. The technology hadn't changed at all. So if you look after your lenses, you can expect to get most of your money back when you sell them. Um, unlike camera bodies, which you're only going to realise a fraction of what you paid for them if they're a few years old when you sell them. Okay, that's enough information for this video. I will be back in the next one with a quick start guide which will give you the main 
key points that are quickly going to improve your photography and will help you to achieve the results that you were expecting when you bought your first nice camera. Okay, bye for now.